I think when our descendants look back on this time, maybe from the safety of a hundred years from now, or maybe from only fifty years from now, I think that they will see that maybe one of the greatest scars across our human family at this time is the scar of displacement, of homelessness, of feeling meaningless, of feeling fruitless, of feeling unbelonging. It's one of the most profound needs that we as a human family have is to belong, which is why the sort of simplistic rhetorics of this time are having such a powerful effect. Because against those is running this great tide of homelessness which has its physical manifestations in the most shocking and inescapable ways, but it also has its inner manifestations that many people don't feel at home either in their own lives. You know, probably every one of us here has the privilege of returning this, this afternoon, this evening, to a relatively safe environment. And we are extraordinarily privileged for that. But there are many, many who are returning to safe environments on the outside who are feeling so hugely safe, unsafe, on the inside. And it's both those agonies that I've been feeling very called to think about, not just in this recent month preparing for this service today, but in this recent decade. So much of what I've written about has really addressed this. How do we allow the sacred call to unconditional hospitality to arise in our own hearts and to become really meaningful in the ways in which we move through the world so that the very presence that we're bringing to people is itself a statement of acceptance. And I really feel so strongly that those of us who are in a very privileged position not to have to think about the most basic necessities of life, could really think very carefully about the kind of hospitality we are offering to the ways in which we think about ourselves. Because of course that determines how we will think about the so-called other. Do we really see those people as brothers and sisters on the path of life? Or do we see them as in some meaningful way different from ourselves and therefore possibly able to be shunned, exiled, locked up, treated with contempt? I think this is an absolutely central question for us. And of course our beautiful Su Sufi poet Rumi has something to say when he thinks about the ways in which we exile also parts of ourselves, in which we shun parts of ourselves, in which we debase and disrespect parts of ourselves. And he calls to us in this exquisitely poetic, lyrical, musical way that he has, the kind of bypasses some of the you know, I could do this, I couldn't do that, thoughts of the, of the mind and go straight to the heart and to the soul, which is the only place where change will really happen. And he says, this being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. This is terribly challenging because we like to think, oh, I'll welcome this, I'll push that away. This feels good, that feels bad. No, Rumi is saying, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent 
as a guide from beyond. It's tremendously challenging, isn't it? We are so used to dividing into the welcome and to the unwelcome with people and also with ourselves. So I was thinking this morning and yesterday and the previous days very much about what would be three expressions of sacred hospitality that I could bring you today. And the first would be our most fundamental sense of self. Who am I? Can we give hospitality to that? Who am I in all my completeness? And what is my completeness? What does it include? And what have I been inclined to put in the shadows? Can I bring it all in? Can I own it all? Can I regard it all as my teacher? I think we can. I truly think we can. And the second aspect of this sacred hospitality is the ideas, the ideals, the visionary impetus that we are also giving hospitality to. What strengths are we welcoming? And the third is our spiritual practice. How much hospitality are we giving to our spiritual practice, to seeing everything that happens in our lives, everything that happens in our lives as practice for growing in the strength that our world so needs, in growing in the love that our world so needs. The question of self-perception is something that I've talked with you many, many times over the years. But maybe the most important aspect of that is not just to move beyond the now familiar notion that we are more than body, we're more than feelings, we're more even than heart, that we are also souls moving through this human adventure, meeting other souls, as best we can, learning from those other souls, being shaped by them, and noticing also that they are being shaped by us, that we are influencing and we are influenced in this magnificent dance that we call life. But even a little bit deeper than that, how are we giving hospitality to the soul? How are we allowing the soul itself to speak to us? That small, quiet voice within. Are we leading such noisy lives that the spirit, the soul, has no chance to speak to us? Another Sufi teacher, much closer to our own time, Hazrat Anayat Khan, and we had the glorious pleasure of his grandson being with us just a week ago. And he wrote before his passing in 1927, humankind thinks, speaks, and acts according to the pitch to which the soul is tuned. I so love that. We've always had such an emphasis in our services on music, haven't we? Because the, the music also reaches into the soul, heals the soul, strengthens the soul so that we can go out and be messengers of love in the particular ways that our life is calling us to. And Hajrat Anayat Khan says, the highest note one could be tuned to is the divine note. This is nothing to do with dogma. It's nothing to do with belief. It's allowing the divine note to tune us. It's allowing the messages of music to tune us, the messages of poetry, the messages of encounter, the messages of love, the kind word, the meal, the lunch, the come to my table, though you have no money, come, the message of welcome, the message of hospitality. And he says, once you arrive at you begin to express the manner of God in everything you do, a manner which is not only beautiful, but which is beauty itself. It's a call that we can feel quite daunted by, and yet we can give hospitality to it. If not us, who? Why not? Not despising any part of ourselves, not despising any part of our experience, but also allowing those difficult experiences to soften us and to perhaps be less judgmental, less hostile, less critical, because we are all such tender creatures and we need that. 
along with that, of course, and intrinsic to it, is the whole question of how are we choosing the ideas that we will pay most attention to. Those of you who've read Forgiveness and Other Acts of Love will remember that I said very strongly there, and I've said it so many times since, what we pay most attention to will dominate our perspective, dominate our thinking. So if we see ourselves in our great, glorious imperfection, nevertheless, as people willing to receive love and to give it, we will grow in that strength. We will grow in that abundance and we will grow in that gratitude. And it is not always easy. Sometimes it is very tempting to nurse and, and sit upon the things that are not going right. And sometimes we need to see how we might do something differently next time. But we can also listen to the soul, to what the soul is telling us about the strengths that we have and that we need for that next time, or perhaps to avoid there being a next time. So being quite conscious, waking up, once was blind but now I see, being conscious of what stirs the soul in its strengths is also part of our sacred hospitality. And the third, this hospitality to our spiritual practice. I think all of you know that I regard all of life as spiritual practice, not just the uncomfortable moments, also the glorious moments. Let's learn from them so that we will have more of them, so that we will give more of them, so that we will embrace more of them, so that we will feel far less guilty about them and far more abundant in our enjoyment. But I also want you to hear this. This is one of the teachings from one of our great wisdom teachers that really, really touches my soul. These are words that are attributed to Jesus and they have a kind of authenticity to them that I can really resonate with. And these are the words, come to me, all you who struggle and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from my example. In the deepest reaches of your souls, you will find rest. I'm not sure that you'll find it anywhere else. How? How? He answers that. My yoke is gentle. I don't feel too burdened with this. I don't feel too burdened with this. It's not too much for me. Because in meeting you, I meet somebody who really is very close to myself. <coughs> and then he goes to say, my burden is light. My burden is light. And that's also part of sacred hospitality, bringing in the light in order that we can meet each other also in times of darkness. It means all of our experiences become spiritual practice, that life itself becomes our primary teacher, if we will allow that. But it's mediated within this context through the wisdom of the soul, which is far greater, far richer, far more spacious, far more open than the wisdom so-called of the familiar mind. When we can just escape some of the constrictions of the familiar mind, and let our thoughts rest in the place of the soul, which is of course a placeless place, when we can draw from our collective soul, our collective wisdom, our, our collective experiences and our collective longings for love and for belonging, then we will bring to the moments of our being a grace that alone we could never ever attain to. I want to just finish with some more very favorite words. And before I do, I want to just say if there's just one thing you go home with today, it would be to ask, I would ask this of you, that you would give in your own way, 
in whatever way is appropriate to you in this moment of your life, in this moment of your spiritual maturation, that you would give more hospitality to love. What we love, we will protect. And if we look around us in our troubled world, in our world of incredible injustice and inequality, we can see very clearly that we don't love enough. We don't love fruitfully enough. We don't love unconditionally enough. So let us grow more and more into our great potential to love. Not just one another, but also ourselves. Loving ourselves, it will become self-evident that we would love one another. And especially, especially, because this is my passion and I think it's the passion of so many of you, let us grow into our potential not only to love but to keep safe the children of our world. If that was our highest priority, a thousand, a million, a trillion decisions would be made differently. So to this teaching, which is a beautiful old one from the book of Deuteronomy, where God says, I call upon heaven and earth as witness. I have put before you life and death, blessings and curses. And what does God want for us? Choose life. Choose life. Choose life so that you and your descendants, so that the children now and the children yet to be born can truly live. Bless it.